My name is Christopher Gregg. In the streets and in prison, I'm known as Big Perm. To this day, I'm still known as Big Perm. I go by the handle Gangish on YouTube, but overwhelmingly people know me as Big Perm. I want to talk about my story. As a matter of fact, I'm looking in the thing. I want to take these off and possibly con convey better emotion, right? Where's the camera? There's the camera. So I was incarcerated for the first time at 13 years old. I spent close to 14 years of my life um, incarcerated, uh, 10 as an adult, close to 10 as an adult, a little under 10 as an adult, and four as a juvenile, close to four as a juvenile. Same, same thing. I mean, I was basically on paper from the time I was 13 until about 32, 33, maybe whenever I finally was done. I mean, just a couple of years ago, basically. I don't even think it's been that long. Maybe 34. I think 34. I think I've been off paper for three, four years now. Maybe 35. I think it's 35. I've been off paper for four years and 39 now. So from 13 to 35 years old, for 23 straight years, I was on some form. I was either incarcerated in a group home in something, juvenile hall, prison, jail, solitary confinement, whatever. Um, I spent four years in solitary confinement initially for assaultive behavior. Um, my first 13 months in prison, uh, I spent eight of those months in the hole. Uh, I managed to catch uh, three class one uh, assault uh, write-ups in the five months that I did in population. Uh, I also managed to catch a write-up for Hooch I got wrapped up with a bunch of guys for hooch. We were making hooch in uh, the Buena Vista kitchen in the high side. I got kicked out of the mods immediately for assaulting somebody after like 30 days. And then uh, I went to uh, Puny and uh, assaulted another guy who I thought, I felt he was plotting on me. Word came down, I thought he was plotting on me. So I said, well, I'm gonna get him before he gets me. So I assaulted that fool. And went to the hole for a while and came out and then we went and fought and then it was just over. We just squashed it. But um, we got it. Okay, so in that five months I was in population, actually in population, I did manage to, damn, I just hit the camera. I did manage to um, get a write-up for, for Hooch. We worked in the, it wasn't like a dish. It, was, it wasn't a dish pit. It was for like washing out carts. And it was a high pressure water hose. And so the water would be like 120 degrees. So it would come out scorching hot and it was high pressure. And so above it was super, super hot in this room. So we cracked into the ceiling and shoved a bunch. We'd throw everything you needed for some hooch up there, put some rubber bands on it so it'll burp right and just throw it up there and just leave it for like three days, like 72 hours because it was so hot. Like 72 hours, you'd have wine in 72 hours. So we were on about our, maybe our third or fourth batch of uh, making wine. And, and one of the white boys, I think his name was Mouse. He was cool, man, but he couldn't handle his liquor. And that fool worked in, he worked in the dish paint with some dude named Champagne, a black dude named Champagne. That fool was cool as fuck too. I remember him. Champagne, and then there was a dude named Reed Gully who worked with me. He's a transgender now. My understanding is he's a transgender now. There was a dude named Jason Goods who's a goddamn fool. I wish I could get him on camera. Uh, Goods, Gully, the, Gladden. There was a dude named Gladden who I watched dump a whole, damn, this all happened in five months. I watched that dude drop a whole, uh, release a whole vat of boiling water into his boots. That was one of the worst things I ever saw in prison. It was it was bad. By the time they got his boots off, like his skin was gone. It was just, and he was screaming. It was horrible. That was a bad day. That was rough. And all this happened over the course of like a five month period. Thanksgiving 2002, the dude jumped off the third tier, bounced rolled around on the ground for a while. That's neither here nor there. That's not my story. I'm supposed to be talking about my story. Here we go. So anyway, um, assaulted behavior. I went to the box the first time uh, for about 18 months or something like that, solitary confinement for 18 months. Um, it takes, it takes a lot from you. To this day, I have trouble uh, forming relationships with people. Um, 
not forming relationships, but forming close relationships. A lot of friends, mm. you're good, you know, but as far as close relationships are concerned, no. And that's one of the reasons that I'm kind of trying to make this video because it's hard for me to convey my emotions, but I'm gonna try some of the things that have happened, some of the things that have emotionally affected me whenever I, in 2004, you know, when they, uh, the police and the task force raided my house, uh, I was living with my mom and I just gotten out of prison. Uh, I was only out maybe 90 days before they raided me and they raided my house. And my little brother was there, the one that just went into the military and they kicked in the door and uh, they, they they kicked in the door whenever I heard them kick in the door. I was on top of a woman at the time. We hadn't started getting busy, but we was about to. And whenever they kicked in the door, my door was kind of like halfway cocked open and I looked over to my bedroom door and whenever they kicked in the front door, the front door was in line with my bedroom door and it was halfway cocked open. And whenever I looked at it, I could see the beams. The beams were passing through the house as they had their beams on that back door and they were coming for me in the back. But I can remember my little brother screaming. He was like two years old and it scared the fucking shit out of him. He doesn't remember it. He says he doesn't remember it. And like he was only two years old, so he probably doesn't. But I can still remember the way that he screamed. You know what I mean? And I can remember thinking he that that was innocent. He didn't hate he didn't ask for none of this shit. You know? And and that still bothers me. That certainly still bothers me. So when you end up choosing a life as a career criminal, you choose to hurt everybody around you basically on a consistent basis. I mean, so I end up in uh, Buena Vista, uh, the whole, basically after like the third assault, they're just like, we're, we're over it. The third assault was something stupid. It wasn't even a, a, a real assault. It was one dude who didn't want to fight somebody. He didn't want to fight this dude named Albert who he, he knew could fight like a motherfucker, and he figured he'd rather take his chance with me. He wasn't sure if I could fight or not, but he was like, I'll take my chance with that dude. And he just called me out randomly, like, for no reason. Like, it was literally for no reason. His name was Justin, I don't fuck remember, some dumbass white boy. Uh, and he ended up checking in. And that was the thing, is we went and fought, and then he didn't want to, uh, 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 he didn't think it was over. He thought my homies were still going to come for him or something like that. And uh, he just went and told, was just like, fuck it, I'll just go and tell. And he went and told him, he went and told him all kinds of shit that we were from rival gangs. I didn't even fucking know that dude, man. I never met that dude before that day. He was like around. I didn't hang out with him. I think he was a crip from Colorado Springs or something stupid. But I didn't see him hanging out with none of the black dudes, none of the black crips. Like, they weren't embracing him. I think he was basically a nobody. He was just a clown. And the fool who was calling him out, that fool Albert, uh, was calling him out. And, and he didn't want to do it was a blood and he didn't want to go with that fool. So he called me a punk just randomly. He was like, fuck that dude, that dude's a punk. I'm like, oh, okay. So we went and fought it out. And then, so whenever it was all said and done, he didn't want to, he, he, he felt like we were going to kept coming after him. Like we just fought. I just went in there and fought with him. There wasn't really a clear winner and that was it. It was the end of it. You know what I mean? And, and so he felt that they were going to keep coming for him. I didn't think anybody was going to do anything. That night, he went and fucking checked in. He went and told them, ah, oh, you got to get me out of here. And he told them everything they wanted to hear about me because they were tired of my fucking shit anyway. Like I said, it was, this was the third. And I had been investigated for two other fights, right? One time I had a black eye. The other time another dude had a black eye and they thought I had something to do with it. We got into a fight in the kitchen. Uh, and so... There was like, it, it was a bunch of, uh, a series of events right after each other where they were just tired of me. They were like, get this dude out of here, you know? So I go to CSP. No, I go to Sterling's Ad Seg the first time and I do like 18 months in Sterling's Ad Seg. And that shit, it robs you of your memories. And it robs you uh, in many ways of your ability to deal with people, right? Um, because all the people that you deal with in the cell uh, agree with you, right? They're, they're on board with everything you got to say. We don't have cellies out here. They don't do that. Um, so anyway, I do like 18 months in the box. There's not much to it. 
you know, you do the same thing every day, every day, every day. And the time just passes. And I can remember uh, uh, Brett Favre throwing for fucking 400 yards the weekend after his father died. You know, shit like that. You got a couple little memories, but that's it. So they finally let me out the box. I got a huge beard, huge beard, and I'm bald on top, and I got this long, crazy hair. I still remember the day I got out the box. I'm sitting there in the chow hall. I was one of the first people that got there for some reason. I don't know why, but I'm, like, sitting in the chow hall. Basically, there's maybe 10 people in there waiting, and I'm sitting here like, I got, I got to see somebody who the fuck's here. You know what I mean? And uh, I seen the homeboy Geronimo, and I'm like, hey, homie, what's up? And I pushed up on him, and that fool backed up. He backed up and put his hands up. He didn't know who the fuck I was. He was like, what is this? You look like a mountain man, dog, you know? But anyway, there wasn't Sterling. Sterling fucking sucks. If we want to talk about Sterling, Colorado, anybody who's ever know, been there knows that it sucks. It's got 30 feet concrete, concrete walls on all sides. So you're basically just inside a giant box, a giant concrete box. That's all you can see whenever you look up. It's just concrete walls. And everybody, all the hatred and gang banging and tension is just focused inward. It's all just fucking hatred inward. It's, it's horrible. So then I'm there for like maybe, I don't know, close to two years. I was there for close to two years. I worked in the kitchen and unit two. That place fucking sucked. I would steal so much shit out of that fucking kitchen. I, I like supported myself. I supported my poker habit. I supported all that shit by stealing out of that kitchen. I robbed that fucking kitchen blind. That'll be a theme in my shit too. It's not that I, I, I don't know what to say about that, but I'm, I'm a fucking thief from hell whenever it comes to the government. I, I don't fucking care. They took a lot from me whenever I was a child. So I changed the fucking menu. I've taken so much food before that they didn't have enough to serve population, that they didn't have enough to keep serving population. They had to change the menu and put something else. And uh, I don't feel bad about it for a fucking second. But point is, so I go there for a while. Whenever I come, let's see, I get out. I get out to the streets and that's whenever I got raided. That's whenever I got raided in 2000. 2004, August of 2004. That's when I got raided, August of 2004. So then I go back again, right? I go back again for a four, another four year bid. I think I cop out to uh, distribution of pills. I think is what they got me for distribution. Uh, that's what I cop out to. I get caught with 17 grams bagged for sale. And the dude comes in, this GKI foo Eddie, Eddie Graham, he's a fucking rat. He ended up ratting on a murder case later on on his own homies. Ended up ratting on a murder case. Now that fool is doing 32 years and fucking basically in protective custody out here. He's in like a like the sex offender pod. They got a sex offender pod, in my understanding is, because he's a GKI and them fools are fucking vicious and they're looking for his ass because he's a fucking rat. And so he's he's hiding. But at the time, um, this fool fucking ratted. I forget even why I said why I was even talking about that. But, well, that was the point is, that, okay, I got hit in 2004, right? I go back. Uh, this time, whenever I go back, I go back to uh, Walsenburg. That's where I learned how to box. They had boxing stuff there, and I fell in love with boxing. And that's all I would do all day long. This is a lot of the reason why my shoulders are fucked up now, my shoulders and wrists, because uh, they didn't have the best gloves. They didn't have the best bags. They didn't have the best wrist wraps. We wouldn't always use wrist wraps, da, da, da. And I can remember the old timers like RC, telling me fucking use the wrist wraps youngster he's like i can't even do push-ups he was really in shape he's like i can't even do push-ups anymore homie because i was stupid and i didn't use wraps and he was fucking right he was i could do a push-up now but not many my wrists are fucked um so he was right about that but so i fell in love with boxing over there that's all i would do is just be on the punching bag all day long punching bag all day long steal everything i fucking could out of the kitchen same thing just try to try to get the kitchen for everything that you could you know, um, rob everything. I remember they hit the, the, the watch call there. They hit the, I'm not going to say who did it. They're probably still pissed about that, but I'll say it, it happened. They, he went into the drop ceiling of one, one classroom. We got him up into the roof, right? 
he goes into the across through the drop ceiling he's a little dude and goes into the drop ceiling of the fucking classroom and ripped like 10 fucking computers apart and stole all of the CD-ROMs because the CD-ROMs are for uh, tattooing you can rip apart a, a computer and get like three tattoo guns out of a computer but you absolutely destroy the computer so yeah that's like I said, there's a, there, there's a lot of that. My prison experience was a lot of that. I know that there's a lot of people that end up in places that are uber violent. And there was people who were uber violent where, I'm, where, where I was. And these things did happen. But if you, if you follow the fucking rules, you don't end up like that. You don't end up with a bunch of holes in you from, from what I could tell. From what I could tell, from my, my time, my personal time, if you just follow the rules, you won't end up with a bunch of holes in you. And you know what the holes are. You know what the rules are. You know what I mean? You're not supposed to be gambling. You're not supposed to be messing with the homosexuals. You know, you know what I mean? You know the rules. You know the rules. Even as a gangbanger, even in their gangbanging, if you just follow the gangbanging rules, go work out every day. You know what I mean? Don't mess with the homosexuals. Do the things that you're supposed to do. Nobody bothers you. You know, you got to handle business whenever it's time to handle business. But that's it. I forget why I got off on that tangent too. But this is basically just going to be a synopsis of, of my life, and it's got a lot to do with prison. And I'm I, like I said, I was a thief from hell, so I stole everything, everything I could get my hands on. So we tear apart shit, whatever. I eventually I end up getting kicked out of that place. I forget even what I got kicked out of that place for. It was a really good prison. I love that prison. I end up in Ordway. I end up in Ordway, and as soon as I get to Ordway these fools there's like one of my homies on the other side of the yard and there's one of my homies on this side of the yard and this fool's just getting like punked out dog like he's just getting punked out and so they uh the north siders like punked him out in front of me and i'm like what what is that i just told him like the north siders are still sitting there i said hey homie what, what's the deal with that dog you know what i mean what, what, you just gonna let these fools bulldog you what's the deal homie you know you ain't gonna do nothing, cause you could leave, homie. If if they're gonna just be punking you out like that, you could just leave, homie. You won't be on the yard, right? And so that whole situation, this uh, piqued the ears of uh, one of some people that we were kind of beefing with at the time, and they said, "Wait a minute, there's one of these fools on the yard, and this fool's not. This fool's gonna buck. You know what I mean? This fool's gonna buck up and be like, fuck you. You know what I mean? Cause I'm not, I'm not keeping my shirt on, right?" on the yard, you know, I'm not covering, I'm not covering none of that. I'm not covering none of that, homie. I'm, I'm on the yard, homie, I'm a factor. So, uh, whether either that or I'm gonna be in a hole or we all gonna be in a fucking hole. So, um, that, then the wheels start turning against me. And whenever that happened, they ended up, I, I don't know. They told me that they jumped one of them, but the word that I get later on is that it was just a one-on-one, -on -one, but that my homie had lost bad. And though, but I got the word that this fool got jumped. And so as soon as I, as soon as that happened, I said, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go after this fool. I'm gonna go after the dude who I think is responsible because I know what the situation is. We're all sitting here politicking together. I know who I think is to blame. So as soon as I see him, I go after him, right? Like 15 of us end up in the hole. We end up all in the hole in deep segregation and what they call deep segregation in Ordway, Colorado, because regular segregation is dry cells. And so you literally be in the hole and you could come out of your cell and just go get the heads with somebody else. It's a, it's a trip because it's dry cells. They have to let you come out to go. This is in a level four yard. They have to, they can't lock your door. They have to let you go to the bathroom. So they can't lock you in your cell. It's a, it's a trip yard, it's a dangerous yard too. So we all end up in deep segregation where you're locked, locked down, slammed down. And, and that night, they come and do a midnight run on like 12 of us, and they ship us all to Lyman. Well, Lyman is the big boy yard, even the, the, the biggest of the big boy yards out here where you're still in population, right? So we shoot the Lyman. Um, they end up putting us through what is called an STG program. STG is uh, an acronym that stands for Security Threat Group. Um, gangs, gang affiliation is what this means. And so they put you through this program where you wear orange pants and you program all day in these gang classes and stuff like that. And they put you in orange pants so they can see you at all times. Anywhere you're, you're going on the yard, they can see you. They know where you're, where you're supposed to be, where you're not supposed to be. 
And so you just stand out. You know what I mean? You go last for child. You're supposed to be last in every line. Da, da, da. You know what I mean? You just stand out big time. They do this on purpose so they can keep an eye on you. So, but I'm, we make it through the little program there. We do a little nine-month program, you know what I mean, and get in, and, and shoot out onto the yard, and everything kind of gets smoothed out. Uh, just politically, everything kind of gets smoothed out. And then we're there. Uh, I'm there for a couple years. And the uh, the homie Chaos, actually, that I made a video with the other day, the homie who's doing a 54-year bid on the street, uh, we, uh, we got wrapped up on some shit together. And uh, it ended up falling on me. I'm not going to go into it too much because uh, he's actually still doing a sentence. So, uh, but um, it ended up falling on me. Uh, I made no statements. They really couldn't do anything as far as criminal charges were concerned. They wanted to, but they couldn't um, because they didn't, they just didn't have it. They didn't have it, but they had enough to send me back to the box, right? For what is that? The third time, I think. That's back for the third time. So now, no, that's only the second time, but I did do a year in orange pants and we did nine months in the hole. And then we did like six months in orange pants. And then I do two years in lineman and then I go back to the box, right? So now I go back to CSP. No, 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 this is my first time in CSP. 2008 is my first time in CSP. That's what it is, 2007. So I shoot back to, to the penitentiary. Um, I'm there for the rest of my sentence till they MRD me, maybe 11 months or something like that. So I do like another 11 months in the hole right there. And then I, uh, I get out to the street um, and I'm out for about eight months. Um, I'm selling drugs the entire time, just doing the fucking most, uh, being retarded. Um, they send me to, uh, let's see, what do I catch then? I end up getting a, a what's called, I'm out for eight months and I get a parole violation. My, I'm selling dope and my parole officer shows up at my house. And what got me was the Dyson vacuums is whenever the Dyson vacuums first came out, right? Whenever the Dyson vacuums first came out, we, I had a, a, a customer who was stealing them and I had two of them in my house and they were like $500 vacuums. So whenever they first came out and my parole officer showed up and my house was nice. My house was really nice. And I had maybe like five, $600 in my pocket and she's going through my shit and she goes, where's all this money from? And she's looking around the house like I got like a flat screen. This is in like 2007. You know what I mean? She's like, what the fuck are you doing? She said, those vacuums cost $500 a piece. I know because I got one for Christmas. She said, you should not have two of those. You don't have a fucking job. And she was like, you're going to jail. You're going back to jail. And she, they had found a switchblade. I had a real switchblade just sitting there on the counter. She's like, you're going back to jail for this? You're going back on a parole violation. She goes, I know it ain't much. And she goes, I know you're probably doing a lot more. There's probably a bunch more shit that you're up to, but you're going back to jail because I don't want you catching a huge fucking case. So he sent me back. I go right back to the box again. I go right back to AdSig again, right? Because I've been out for less than a year. And if you've been out for less than a year, it becomes a rubber stamp and they just send you right back. So now I do five months in the hole in solitary confinement in DRDC. And this is where I told the story before the dude who was holding people hostage with poop. So he, uh, he liked to wipe poop all over everything. If they didn't give him what he wanted, anytime they, the cops didn't give him something that he wanted, he just wiped poop all over the damn place. And then there was another dude next to me, a black dude named Brown, who was crazy. And he would have fights with himself. There was nobody else in the cell, and they would just, ah, he'd freak out. He'd be in there screaming, fuck you, bitch, I'll fuck you up. And you hear papers flying, you know. Uh, solitary confinement was something fucking else, dude. I tell you what, and this is just, by this time, I'm just used to it already. Box time is just like, oh, okay, let's get you a routine, you know, get you a workout routine, a good stretching routine so your back don't mess up on you. You got to stay limber. Always want to stay limber. And uh, 
you know, get you as many good books as you can. Colorado's pretty good as far as the library is concerned. I read thousands and thousands of books in solitary confinement. This is why I've been able to, um, this is why I've done so good in college, I believe, is because I've actually, uh, I've read thousands of books. I've read several books numerous times. I used to read, would read like a novel and like a textbook at the same time or a history book at the same time, just for, just for a change, you know what I mean? Because you're reading for eight, nine hours a day whenever it's all said and done. Uh, because uh, TV, you know, TV back then is just fucking horrible. I mean, it's like Roseanne, a fucking ESPN, you know what I mean? Con Air, shit like that. You know, Nicholas Cage, The Rock. Remember the, remember the, the movie The Rock, Nicholas Cage, or fucking, or Face Off, you know, something like that. It's like the same fucking shit, dude. The Drew Carey show, The Price is Right. It's just the same shit over and over and over and over again. And so that gets old but the books change you know what I mean you keep ordering books out of the library the books change so that that really grounded me as far as an education is concerned whenever I was able to uh, whenever I finally enrolled myself in college my comprehension was you know what I mean my comprehension was up there as far as the English language is concerned and it really helped me uh, it, it helped me do a lot of things but so okay so that time we go to solitary confinement again. I get back out, fuck up again. And they send me back for my remainder. And then I take my ass to Cheyenne Mountain, right? But I know I was going back that time. I knew they were gonna come get me. So I had a bunch of dope with me. I had like two ounces of, uh, two ounces of weed and like a quarter ounce of uh, Coke with me whenever I went back. That was a fun time. We had a, me and the homie Justice Narrow, some fucking blizz, and a bunch of motherfuckers. I had the whole Cheyenne Mountain. We was blowed, homie. We was blowed. We blew like two ounces in like three weeks, homie. Had a fucking great time. We're living good, homie. Oh, and I was blazing up in the fucking Denver County, too. Damn, what was that black dude's name? That was a cool ass black dude. He was like running the party. He was kind of, he was a cool, old, cool fucking dude. I can't remember that dude's name. And then there was a dude who used to be a professional skateboarder. He was all fat now, though. He loved to fucking eat. I motherfucker loved he, he used to be a professional skateboarder. He was like Peruvian or something like that. I feel had a mean drug habit. But but yeah, we'd be in the county. We were fucking blazing in Denver County. We were fucking blazed up in uh, fucking Cheyenne Mountain like a motherfucker. And uh, so I went back to Cheyenne Mountain. I was there for like, you know, maybe 18 months or something like that. I think I went and did a couple months in a camp. By this time, I was just, you know what I mean? I fucking old man already. Not an old man, but everybody knew me. You know, you don't run into much drama. After you've already done so much time, you don't run into a lot of drama. So there's not a lot, a whole lot of drama towards the end of it. Um, but uh, got out and started running amok again. You know what I mean? Because I'd been locked up since I was a little kid. I got out, I started running amok again. And uh, I ended up getting caught. I ended up getting caught for... Uh, I forget what the hell I get caught for. What a high speed chase. I get in a high speed chase and I get away, but they got the license plate of the car. They know whose car it is, da 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 da. Right? The county that I'm in says they don't want to give me no love whatsoever. They just basically said, go back to prison. Well, the, the, the kicker was is that what I had originally gone to prison for in 2001 was robbing a task force officer's house, a West Metro Jefferson County task force officer's house. And this is where I caught the high speed chase. So they looked at it. They said, this fool took guns, badge, all that good shit from a cop. One of our cops a long time ago, we're not going to give him no play, like nothing. They gave me, my offer was take three years and go back to prison, the max. Take the maximum for a high speed set, high speed chase, three years and go back to prison. That was my deal. So I said, fuck you, I'm gone, dog. So I take off and this is whenever Dr. Bounty Hunter starts looking for me. I was on the run for months. That motherfucker couldn't catch me. He's fucking sorry. Dr. Bounty Hunter's fucking soft. I mean, this fool just running around. All he does, all his whole show was, is just running around trying to bribe people. That's all they do is they run up. They try to get you to tell. And if you won't tell, then they fucking, uh, uh, they turn the camera off. And then they try to slide you some money. They slid my homie $5,000. They tried to slide my homie $5,000 to tell on me, right, with the cameras off. 
So that fool's a fucking dirtbag. He ain't no detective. This fool acts like he's a detective. He's just running around fucking bribing people. And that fool couldn't even catch me. They had all kinds of bounty hunters running around the hood on 3rd and Santa Fe showing my picture and shit. You know what I mean? The homies would be calling me right away. The homie on Diga called me, hey, these fools are down here looking for you, dog. <laughs> you know what I mean? They couldn't find shit, homie. These motherfuckers couldn't find shit. Dog. So anyway, anyway, so I go on a, a, a crazy fucking crime spree, right? And then I get caught. I'm hitting houses, kicking in the door of houses. I go hit this fucking house. Turns out the woman's in the house whenever I hit the house. I didn't know she was in the house whenever I hit the house. She goes up into the attic and calls her dad, says there's somebody in the house. Some fucking weird dudes broke into the fucking house. I don't know there's anybody in the fucking house. I'm ransacking the motherfucking house, dog. She's up in the thing. She's up in the attic talking to her dad. Her dad said, man, you got to hang up. You got to call the cops. I can't help you. You got to call the cops. So she calls the cops. I'm busted because I'm in the house whenever the cops show up. So they're, that's the end of that, right? There's a plane. So. So I'm flat busted on that one. There, there's nothing I can do about that. I go back, now I'm in Arapahoe County, Arapahoe County, Colorado, because that's where the house was at that I got hit, that I was hitting, that I got caught hitting. So I'm in Arapahoe County, and uh, they, I go in front of the judge, and I says, hey, man, you know, I, I want some fucking help, you know? I've been in prison since I was 18 years old, you know, a little bit of fucking help, dude. Like, can we at least try something? before I go to prison for the rest of my life. Cause that's what it was, that's what it was suiting up to be. Is just, you know, you might as well just habitualize and become a habitual criminal. This is fucking it. So, and they said, yeah. They said, we're gonna give you 10 years and we're gonna suspend it based on the completion of Pier 1. Okay. So, I went to Pier 1 and it was the hardest fucking thing that I ever had to do. Uh, and the hardest thing that you could ever think of is just saying, okay, whenever somebody says, you fucking piece of shit, you fucked up, you did this, you did that, and you know you didn't, and you can't say anything but okay, you just got to accept it. You got to accept life as life is, and we don't like that. As convicts, we don't like that. We like to, you know, we'll push back against the situation, but uh, it taught me to deal with life. About two years into the program, uh, I started college. Um, I will graduate with a bachelor in technical communication in December. And um, I've come farther than I ever thought I would. I still have uh, serious problems uh, socializing with people, building long-term bonds with people not flashing on people whenever things uh, things annoy me, perpetually annoy me, you know, the things that really aggravate you, but that you have to like, you know, it's stupid shit, stupid shit. People touching my shit, get mad at an eight year old kid for touching your shit. The kid don't fucking know better, you know, shit like that. But It's been a long journey, and I hope that you will choose to take the journey with me because uh, I'm just getting started. I'm just barely learning. Most of this video stuff has nothing to do with my degree, almost nothing to do with my degree whatsoever. I learned all of this on my own, and I will continue to uh, learn new skills. Um, and so what I turn into uh, is going to be an interesting, it's going to be an interesting ride. So I hope you'll take it with me. Let me know what you think. That's, um, that's my story, as is, is real as I can give it to you. There's still a bunch of color that can be added in between all of those. Um, I ran, I'm not even going to get into it. Thank you. If you've watched for this long, thank you. Bye.